and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Very pleased to welcome our great friend, Father Brian Milady, OP, about his book for EWTN Publishing, The Decalogue Decoded, What You Never Wanted to Learn About the Ten Commandments. But if I know, Father, you're going to learn about it anyway. Great to see you. Well, hopefully. Good to see you, Doug. Well, yes. it's interesting, too, because you've got The Decalogue Decoded. And uh, thank goodness it says Ten Commandments, because I bet you most people don't know what the Decalogue is. Right. Well, it's the hand, uh, you know, the people, the marketers entitled it that, but. Well, there's a lot of alliteration in there, so absolutely. it sounds interesting. And the coding, I think, sounds Right, nice. it kind of, kind of makes like it sound Vinci mysterious code. and yes, stuff yeah. like that. So, now it's interesting, too, because this is something you actually did for EW10 as a series Many years, years ago, right? Many years ago, yes, like in the early 90s. Right, one of my favorites, I can say, before I came here. Yes. Uh, and still is. So, you know, the question you have today with uh, looking at something that you might have done in the 90s and then putting it into a book form like this. Uh, did you make any major revisions to it? Were there updating you needed to do in your thinking or what? When I made the original series, the catechism hadn't yet been translated into English. And I don't know if you're familiar with the letter that Pope Benedict just, Emeritus Benedict just wrote about the crisis. Mm -hmm. But he stated that there was a big crisis of moral theology of the denial of the natural law. And one of the problems was, and we still experience it today in confessional practice, is people don't know what the individual specific sins are. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that there needed to be an explanation mm -hmm. of what each of the commandments was about, what virtue it was pushing, and also what the individual sins were that were against that particular commandment, mm -hmm. especially to form confessional practice. Right. Now, the catechism came out, and as you know, there's been a few modifications of it since then. The person who wrote the original draft of the catechism was excellent. Mm -hmm. So I did have to update some things to correspond to what sort of the evolution of the church has been on this, right, or at least try to explain it. Right, because I know that you even discussed capital punishment. Briefly, here, yes. Right, right. And also, when I did the original series, I didn't really look deeply into things like the obligations of lawyers, witnesses, and prosecutors under the Eighth Commandment. Mm -hmm. And I was using the Summa. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the rules of evidence have changed a lot mm -hmm. since then. And so I had to try to explain when a defendant today, for example, says he's not guilty, he doesn't mean he didn't do it. Right. He's meaning it's the burden of proof is on the court to prove it. In the Middle Ages, for example, when St. Thomas was writing, a judge could directly question a defendant. But as you know, at least in our system, right. you can't do that It's anymore. more similar to what they do in England. Right. Still. right yeah. And so that sort of thing had to be explained, what his moral character was and what the obligations of various officials of the court were, those kinds of things. Right. You, you started changed. off and you say, our origin and destiny, you say, now the primary characteristic of God is that he is one. Therefore, all the various states of being and lower orders of creation are meant to obey the power of God's mind and law. This way, they are in a proper relationship of order and love with him, seeking to become one. Right. Uh, everything comes forth from God in multiplicity, but each on its own level seeks to return to him. So, for example, the rocks of gravity or the large material bodies. Then when it comes to the plants, you have photosynthesis where you synthesize all these elements for uh, cellular growth. And then the animals, you have the sensitive life. But in human beings, that unity where we seek to return to him is through our intelligence. Mm -hmm. And as you remember, the human race wandered for centuries after the sin in ignorance. So God sought to give unity again to our intelligence about why we're here, mm -hmm. both regarding the natural law and regarding our preparation to receive Christ in Israel mm -hmm. when he gave the commandments to Moses. Now, um, the, the Torah of the Jews then is still our primary enlightenment regarding our intelligence as to what the objective human acts are mm -hmm. by which we have to return to God what Christ adds in the New Testament is the motivation behind it and the fact that they're now done through grace and love, even though, of course, in Deuteronomy, as you know, mm -hmm. we're supposed to do this lovingly, too, and the prophets are very clear about that. But the commandments are the primary enlightenment of the intellect mm -hmm. regarding our moral life, and that's why we can't dispense with them. 
Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he abolishes the specific applications of them to Israel, mm -hmm. but not the original Ten Commandments themselves. And in the Sermon on the Mount, which is where the new law of Christ is explained, he says, you've heard it said, and then he quotes the commandments, but then he says, I say to you, but then he gives the proper interior motivation for living these. Mm -hmm. So we need to study the commandments still and what the objective acts are. And you can see that right. in John Paul II's encyclical on the splendor of truth. Right. Remember, he begins with the rich young man, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Christ say? What do you read in the law? And then he quotes the Ten Commandments. And Christ says, yes, do this and you'll live. But then if he's going to be perfect in his motivation, then he has to embrace evangelical poverty, which he finds difficult. Well, well it's do. interesting because in, in making that distinction, we, we kind of move from this legalistic idea to this spiritualizing idea. Right. But somehow, rather than being working together, they tend to be juxtaposed against each other. And sometimes it becomes, well, basically, if I feel spiritually okay about this, uh, whether no, it's you or one of that, I feel okay right. about it. Well, you're just being legalistic. So, right. you know, how do you, how do we deal with understanding that dynamic? Well, the love of God is something objective too, and the not only does Moses explain this, or if whoever wrote the Pentateuch, mm -hmm. but also our Lord, and what He does is demonstrate to us, and John is very clear about this. You can't say you love God and disobey the commandments. Mm -hmm. The commandments are the place where you prove your love of God. So to say, well, I'm going with my gut and that makes it right, that's my conscience. Right, exactly. You right. can't judge me. Well, I mean, I, I know a prelate recently who said, as long as a person's decided in their conscience they should do something, the priest should help them do it. I thought, so if my conscience tells me, I'm supposed to fly a plane into the World Trade Center. The priest is supposed to help me buy the plane. Right, right. No, it's a right conscience, and a right conscience is objectively determined. Mm -hmm. And that means you can't disobey the commandments and say you're loving God because obedience and love go together. Right, that's they're what both you, you a said. union of wills right. based on a common Perfect truth. Perfect companions, you call Right. It. Now, you also say here in the beginning of the first sin, so when God told Adam and Eve that they were not permitted to eat at the, of the tree of, of, good, of uh, knowledge of good and evil, this was not to take away their choice. I never really thought about the fact that they have free will, but is he limiting their choice there? Is that what somebody might think? Well, they could think that if they were follow modern philosophy, oh, okay. because Immanuel Kant, it seems strange to evoke people who lived 200 years ago that many people don't understand, but he basically held that freedom was freedom from any external influence or interference. Well, we don't think that. I mean, we think freedom is living according to the truth. So the truth is proclaimed in the punishment for the sin that then has to be resolved by, of course, first the law teaching us the truth. But remember, the law doesn't in itself confer grace. Mm -hmm. So grace is the natural fulfillment of the law, and the new law of Christ is the natural fulfillment of the old law. But we still have to obey the natural law mm -hmm. in this, because that's our objective nature. Now you say, just because we can make better toilets and put a man on the moon does not mean that we have the answer for the alienation of the human heart that was caused by original sin. Is one of the major problems we have is that many people don't believe in original sin. Many people. And the effects of it. Yes, well, it's the effect of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. philosophy for the last 400 years, that we can solve the problem of human sin ourselves. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, once gave a talk on the problems confronting the faith in Europe today in 1989, and he talked about the afterlife. And he says, man, he heard a preacher in Germany first try to deny the existence of hell, then purgatory, then heaven, and basically try to convince his con congregation that what's described in the scripture as a better world is one that we produce on our own power here on earth, mm -hmm. but not something after this life. So. The Enlightenment's idea was human reason can resolve for every problem. Well, it can't. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in a person like Voltaire in the 18th century, where they have that character, Dr. Pangloss, who keeps saying, but this is the best of all possible worlds. And after all these people have been killed and they've had this plague and everything, he says, it's not. It's not. Mm -hmm. They can't solve the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And we can't solve the problem of evil ourselves. More materialism, and I always like to say more committees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I hate meetings, <laughs> more committees, is not going to change human hearts as such. We take money and throw it at a problem. We have to have more better, what you say, reporting structures or committee structures. Well, I'm not against that. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a value to that. But the real issue occurs, is this a sin or not? Mm -hmm. And we need to ask ourselves that. And plus the fact that in confession, people have become so used to the idea now that it shouldn't be a laundry list of sins, that they'll come in as a mission preacher, I'm often astonished, and they'll say, my last confession was eight years ago. I wasn't very loving. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Was it an idle word? Was it murder? Was it, what do you mean by wasn't very loving? And as you know, the Council of Trent was very specific that for a confession to be integral, mm -hmm. a person has to confess, I'll remember mortal sins kind and number. Mm -hmm. So the book is an attempt to identify the kinds of sin, right. help people think about that So again. the people actually can say, wow, I didn't realize that, or I didn't think that that was any more considered a sin by the church or whatever. Oh yeah, I've had people tell me, and very devout Catholic men, that they didn't know vasectomy was a sin. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's contraceptive. Oh, I guess that's true. Right, right. Well, I remember I had two guys who were very close friends of mine, and they were very devout Catholics. And one of the guys, they were tough men, too. They both were deputy sheriffs. They were Hispanic. And when one guy left, the other guy said, well, you know, Father, deep down we knew it was wrong, but we weren't willing to admit it to ourselves. Right. Well, sometimes you need to read a thing to see what the various problems are, and that's why the catechism puts all those specific sins. What do you mean by the law kills and heals? Well, the law kills in the sense that it doesn't give grace in itself by its external actions, but it heals in the sense that it begins the healing process by which we prepare ourselves to receive Christ. Uh, John the Baptist today, his birth as we celebrate it today, uh, he talks about you know, living a good moral life, and he uses very specific examples to the various professions and things like that. So we have people who claim to be devout Catholics, and yet if they're contractors, they cheat people on building buildings that people have to live in. Mm -hmm. I remember one sister I know who built a convent. She said, if I ever found another religious order, it'll be to pray for the salvation <laughs> of contractors. Because I've known so many people that have built buildings, and five years later, the doors don't work, the windows don't work, the faucets fail. Uh, this kind of thing people need to remember, that these little things, they may seem like little things where you can cut corners, but you're dealing with places that people live in and mm. could possibly harm them. Right, and, um, and, and it's, you're going to have to answer for Injustice, all those actions yes. in, possibly, in the future. You talk about the fact, and this is one I think, uh, beginning with our duties to God, the very first is fidelity, and that's another one that seems very tough in the world we live in today. Right, right. Yes, it's, it's very hard to persevere in fidelity. Uh, I was saying the other day at Mass that I'm always amused in the community whenever a thing goes up on the bulletin board and it begins with after much prayer and reflection, you always know the next sentence is going to be, I've decided to leave the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And you want to say, gee, much prayer and reflection doesn't leave you to stay ever, apparently. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we need to re remember that fidelity is something that we have difficulty doing and we can't do by our own power, we can only do by grace. But fidelity demands recognizing what these powers are in our soul and how our actions fulfill them and other actions destroy them, like idolatry, tempting God, Simony, we're dealing with a lot of problems with simony in our church today, which is the buying and selling of ecclesiastical offices mm -hmm. where people get it because they know someone and have money. Well, that's a sin, and it comes from the Acts of the Apostles. Right. And, and that's a word we don't even hear about anymore. It sounds like something medieval. But it's, yeah, but it's not, apparently, yeah. So uh, clerics, one of the problems clerics have, and people are always talking about how we need to examine ourselves, and it's, it's true, but Part of it turns around the buying and selling of offices. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think for some people, if they adopted the CEO structure, that might seem okay to them, mm -hmm. but it's not okay. Right. And sometimes also, uh, you don't have to have money involved in a sense to buy or True. sell offices True. too. Influence, uh, right. uh, things like that. Also, things like fidelity to going to mass on Sunday you really think God's going to send me to hell because I missed one mass? Well, it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. 
Because, you know, worshiping God is such a serious obligation once you realize that he's the source and end all of everything you have, are, and will be. Right. Yeah. Well, talking about the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and you talk about the two tablets, the first tablet of the law is primarily figurative and not literal. What does that mean? Those are the commandments regarding worship. Mm -hmm. So the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the temple liturgy, the circumcision, are primarily symbolic of what will eventually be fulfilled in Christ. The second tablet, which are the commandments concerning our neighbor, are primarily literal. Mm -hmm. So you can't sacrifice them and say there's, they do have a figurative sense of what the ideal society would be like. Mm -hmm. But you know, you really have to respect weights and measures in the store in order to say that you're truly a moral like person. Like you're talking about with the building codes or like things that, like yeah, that, right? Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Right, and then moving into the first commandment. Commandments, uh, though generally framed in terms of prohibitions, are really about this, our dignity and the relationship of love that God offers us. And then you talk about a kind of marital love God shares with us. Spousal union, right. Um, it's a common idea now, especially after John Paul II, but it's reflected in the prophets, it's reflected in people like John on the cross, that we experience by grace a loving union, spousal union with the Trinity, mm -hmm. so that we are called to adopt a supernatural point of view. Now that demands that we avoid an excess of religion and a defective religion because religion is a virtue. Mm -hmm. How can you be excessive in religion? By giving the worship of God to something that doesn't merit it, like idolatry, for instance. How can you be defective in it? That's by the first commandment. For example, if you believe God in God, the true God, you say he's the first truth, but you call on him to witness to you swearing an oath in a court you know to be a lie, that's a defect of the virtue of religion. So the first two commandments condemn the excess and defect, mm -hmm. and then since virtue stands in the middle, the third commandment seeks to implement just justice now of course charity is important here but primarily what's important in the commandments is justice toward God mm -hmm. where we recognize that everything we have in our comes from him in justice of course we can never repay him right. but we seek to repay him and one of the principal ways we do that in most religions is by the idea of sacrifice but is part of that the idea that most of us don't like to feel obligated to anybody these days true we, including God. Uh, including God, yeah. Um, the, uh, the whole idea of obligation, again, seems to place a limit on my freedom. But if you're obligated to God, who's infinite, and you recognize that, it should set you free. Because mm -hmm. for one thing, it makes you more virtuous. Mm -hmm. And virtue means that you become freer and less bound right. by, by evil, by vice. So right. virtue is really important here. Well, you also talk a little bit about enculturation and obviously proper and misunderstood enculturation because that's a lot of confusing for people, maybe here in the States, especially when they see things that they're not, they don't understand how that really fits into the mass. Well, we also have this uh, synod we're having about culturalization. Mm -hmm. True enculturalization demands that we recognize that there's a certain eternal quality to the way in which Catholics worship God, which is expressed in the ritual. Now that may, in some cases, be adapted to certain cultural expressions, but there are obviously certain cultural expressions that are evil, for instance, mm -hmm. like idolatry or magic or something like that, right. where we can't do that. It just doesn't Well, you say superstition, superstition. Is, not, is not harmless. You no, know, it's not in any sense. I mean, I. I I remember once I was uh, with a group of religious and they started to play with tarot cards. And I got very nervous. I laughed and they thought it was very funny. So I didn't say anything because you don't say stuff. And so about a month later I noticed the tarot cards had disappeared. Mm -hmm. I said, Where, what happened to the tarot cards? Oh, we asked the cards if there was an evil force behind these and they answered yes. Mm, there you go. And we asked if it was the devil and they answered yes. So they went in the trash the next day. And so my comment was, well, the cards are sometimes more intelligent than the brethren are right. when it comes to things. Now in the second commandment, you talk about what is the specific difference between taking God's name vainly and using it justly? Well, when we swear an oath, for example, we use God's name justly. Mm 
when we call upon God and make the sign of the cross and all those things, we use his name justly. The primary place where God's name is used unjustly is the, where we bear false witness, especially in a court by perjury, through calling on him to witness of a truth that we know is a lie. Right. You have in here, uh, the followers of Immanuel Kant, for instance, maintained that a religion without God was just as good as religion with God, as long as we experience feelings of dependency on some higher power. We hear that a lot today. And are thereby led to philanthropic, to be philanthropic towards others. The ideal Kantian ecclesiastic, therefore, is a combination of a socialist and a socialite. Right, right. Because uh, Kant, remember, believed that there was no objective truth that you could know by sensible examination of the universe, which is the way everybody else always did it. So he basically changed the idea of truth. We, the traditional definition of truth for everybody mm -hmm. was the conformity of the idea in my mind to the objective thing outside of it. Kant changed it to the correspondence of the thing to my mind, and he made truth depend on your emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And when it came to ethics, it was the greatest good for the greatest number. So uh, whatever produced feelings of the greatest good for the greatest number was what truth was. And when it came to the truth of God, mm -hmm. he basically said he had to deny faith to find a place for God, uh, anything intellectual. So that's German religion took upon this extremely uh, emotional mm -hmm. expression, where, as I say, the followers of Kant basically thought that as long as you felt that you were depending on some higher power, it didn't matter mm -hmm. what it was like. And the third commandment, bodily reverence. Uh, yes. Since man is not an angel, it is incumbent upon him that he expresses interior devotion and prayer by external actions, because that we always hear, again, put in conflict. Well, it's not what you're really doing outward, right. it's really your internal. Life. Right. Well, we're not angels, and we have bodies, and so we express our internal devotion primarily with external actions. For example, I, I had a professor once who said, you know, you can argue all you want about Christ's presence in the Eucharist, but unless you're willing to genuflect before the tabernacle, the arguments make very little difference. Now, of course, some people can't because they're elderly. Right. But, I mean, the point is that we, by, because we're not angels and we have bodies, we show our external reverence, our internal reverence by our external actions. Right. In fact, you tell a story about Mother Teresa's sister saying they could get plenty of people help with the poor, but it was tough to find people willing to do adoration, adoration right? right. And you also mentioned this earlier, the fourth commandment, the contraceptive mentality leads to the assumption that the value of a person, whether a spouse or a child, is that person's usefulness to another. We no longer think you're good because you exist, but you're good because you make me feel good, this kind of utilitarianism. Right. That's practically a quotation from John Paul II's theology on the, the body. When I say no child but a wanted child, well, we don't have time for children right now. Until they fit into my life, I won't accept them as a gift from God. Now, I know that people often don't intend this to be a utilitarian relationship, but the objective nature of it is, again, that what you're saying is that it has to fit in to my life, and it's not just a gift I receive from the hands of a loving creator. Right. In the fifth commandment, uh, I thought it was an interesting point. You say positive commandments such as the third and fourth do not have to be applied always and in every circumstance. One does not have to love one's parents in every act because one's parents are not always around. Negative commandments, commandments such as the fifth through the eighth, on the other hand, are always active and binding. Right, and that's a classic truth of Catholic theology, and it's also taught by John Paul II in Splendor of Truth, because negative commandments revolve actions which violate the truth. Positive commandments, you're not always in the situation. For example, you have to worship God, but the commandment is that you do so on the Sabbath. So the worship of God, as far as the commandment is concerned, as far as justice is concerned, is expressed by assistance at Mass, basically. Now, in the Sixth Commandment, you talk about celibacy and sexuality. Obviously, we hear about a lot about that in the news today, and how and you say a person who embraces celibacy does not do so out of fear of fatherhood or motherhood. Exactly. Right. Remember, the celibacy, and again, John Paul II was very beautiful in the way he explained this, though it's also an old idea, is not the merely not being married. Mm -hmm. That, together with the virginity, is embracing the idea of marital love, spousal love, which is where you give and receive freely to another, 
but from God's point of view, as it, they neither marry nor are given in marriage in heaven. So in the case of a religious, of course, it's most easily seen in a nun, mm -hmm. where she becomes the bride of Christ. But in the case of the priest, you're basically called upon to be the father to your, uh, basically the church, to follow the church to the celebration of mass and the sacraments, and not limit your fatherhood. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be less masculine than men in the world, you're supposed to be more so by defending the truth. A, a psychiatrist I follow wrote a pamphlet once called The Priest for All Seasons, Masculine and Celibate. Mm -hmm. And he emphasized that we don't give up our masculinity, we're supposed to realize it on a universal level, which we can't do except by grace. Right. Now, you've been very busy besides writing books uh, and doing uh, retreat mastering, etc. You've also been working with uh, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers on several yes. series and miniseries, uh, Grace-Filled Living. Uh, what's the latest? Uh, going well, on? the latest is actually a three-part, three-cycle on the commandments. Right. Right. We call it blueprint, print for, blueprint for, for, I think, God's holy life or okay. something. Yeah. So we can look forward to that on EWTN. Yes. And right now, you can always get this wonderful book. Thank you, Sai. So Thank much, you very always much. Always a pleasure to My speak pleasure. with you, have you on the network. Father Brian Milady, OP, The Decalogue, decoded what you never wanted to learn about the Ten Commandments, published by EW10 Publishing. This is the kind of stuff Mother would say. You may not want to know it, but you got to know it. <laughs> and you can get it through our EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com. Join us next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks.